Good evening. Uh, my name is Larry Taunton, and I'm the executive director of the Fixed Point Foundation. Fixed Point has been engaging hot button cultural issues for a decade. Indeed, it was on this very stage in October of 2007 that professors Richard Dawkins and John Lennox debated the relative merits of atheism and Christianity in a Fixed Point Foundation event that was heard around the world. Tonight's audience is a bit smaller, but the issue is no less important. The issue of gay marriage is one that deeply divides Americans. According to a Pew Forum poll just last month, Americans are divided right down the middle. Nevertheless, some remain undecided, confused, or misinformed. We hope tonight's debate helps you to better understand the difficult uh, and controversial issue of gay marriage regardless of your position on it. Um, now for a bit about our debaters. Will Salatan, national correspondent of Slate Magazine and a contributor to the New York Times, he will be arguing in the affirmative. Um, raised in Texas, and he's a rabid uh, uh, Houston Rockets fan, I've discovered. He uh, graduated with highest honors from Swarthmore College in 1987, where he majored in philosophy. Salatan uh, made a name for himself writing daily columns during the 2004 presidential campaign and is a self-described liberal Republican. He has written extensively on this particular issue and debated in favor of same-sex marriage several times in recent years. He is the winner of the Online Journalism Award for Commentary as well as a winner of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science Award. He lives in Bethesda, Maryland with his wife Martha and their two children. Sharif Girgis uh, will be Salatin's op opposition and uh, he is the author of What is Marriage? Man and Woman, a Defense. Girgis was born in Cairo but was raised in Delaware. He earned a master's degree in moral, political, and legal philosophy at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar in 2008. He is currently pursuing both a PhD in philosophy at Princeton and a JD uh, at Yale Law School. Girgis is a is widely regarded expert on the defense of traditional marriage. He currently resides in New, well, actually you don't reside in New Haven, Connecticut. Would My you like bad. to tell us where you do reside? Princeton, New Jersey. With your wife, Gabby. The beautiful Gabby, yep. Yes, um, you know, a, a, a question to begin, gentlemen, that I, I have um, for both of you, just by way of, of um, letting uh, our audience know where we're going on this. Um, why have you chosen to engage on an issue that is this controversial? Let's start with you, Sharif. Well, that was exactly the reason I did. Um, I thought it was extremely controversial, a lot of heat, and very little liked. It was a conversation that was mostly name-calling on both sides, and I thought, you know, a lot of people who have my instincts on this issue, have the traditional or what I'm going to call the conjugal view, um, think that they have to keep their heads down, but I think there are very strong arguments to be made for their case. There are deep problems, even contradictions, in the opposite case, and I wanted those to be better known. Very good, and, uh, and Will, how about for you? Well, it's very unusual to uh, encounter an issue that um, where you, you strike it at the moment when, um, when a civil right is being acknowledged and when a great wrong is being changed, and, and I, have, I feel as though I have a chance to participate in uh, a transformation of our society and in uh, a change of understanding about an issue that has been, and a phenomenon in human beings that has been misunderstood for ages. Uh, you know, I've had the, uh, the, uh, the day um, to, uh, to spend with both of these gentlemen. Um, I think you will enjoy them. You will find that they're very articulate advocates for their, per uh, their particular um, positions. Uh, and uh, it really has been enjoyable for me uh, over lunch, over dinner um, last night. I look forward to hearing um, your arguments. Now, it's important that I, uh, I say something uh, coming straight out of the gate about Fixed Point Foundation. We are unashamedly a Christian organization. That is to say, we, we do have an, a, a position on the issue of gay marriage. 
Uh, that said, we think we can engage in it in a way that is uh, it's fair to, um, to both parties. We've done uh, uh, debates of this kind all over the world. As I mentioned, we did a, deba a debate here in 2007. Um, a few others um, we've done here in the Birmingham area as well as Oxford University, the Oxford Museum of Natural History uh, uh, in Melbourne, Australia with Peter Singer, Princeton University and a number of other places. So the role that I am playing this evening is that of, of timekeeper um, questions you will notice. Uh, in the programs that have been handed to you. And by the way, speaking of programs, there may be things that are handed out to you as you're coming through the door. Uh, they're not ours. If uh, ours uh, have our logo on it, and uh, we have only one handout for you this evening, and that is um, a program that, that just simply uh, tells you a little bit about Fixed Point Foundation and this particular event. But you have the, uh, the opportunity to text uh, questions, and I, I can't say that I'll ask your question because uh, it's a limited amount of time and there are quite a few people uh, who, are, uh, who are here. But uh, my job is to ask them a few questions, uh, time keep, keep the, uh, the discussion moving along. Um, as for the format for this evening, um, each man will get um, 15 minutes introduction, uh, that is opening statements. And then they will each be given seven minutes to rebut um, those opening statements. Then we will move to a, uh, a Q&A of, uh, of 30 minutes and then five minutes of closing statements. So uh, this is a format that we have followed um, all over the world and we find this to be very effective. Now, it is also important, just a few housekeeping things that I have to say. Um, there's no photography or recordings of any kind that are permitted here. Um, uh, a DVD will be made available for you. You can find that on the Fixed Point Foundation um, website. But the fact that you are here, uh, we take that to mean that you are uh, okay um, with uh, possibly appearing in, uh, in such a DVD. If you're not, um, now is your opportunity to leave. So um, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, delight for me to um, uh, turn the floor over to, um, to Will. And Will, by the way, according to the rules of debate, going first, some people think that that's considered to be an advantage. Generally speaking, it's a bit of a disadvantage. And as a result, he gets to go last. So we begin with you, Will. Uh, thank you, Larry. And uh, thank all of you for coming tonight. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Um, my name is Will Salatan. Uh, as Larry said, I have a wife and two kids, and I live in the suburbs, and I support gay marriage. And tonight, I want to tell you why. Um, actually, Sharif and I saw the posters for this event. We thought about showing up in tuxedos, but we didn't want anybody to get the wrong idea. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> so I'm charged with having grown up in the Bible Belt, and I, I plead guilty. Um, I have friends who are gay, but I also have friends who are conservative and Christian. And I think that gives me a somewhat different perspective on this issue from what you might have heard on the political left or the political right. Uh, I grew up in East Texas in a culture of faith and values, and I've seen those values do a lot of good in the lives of individuals and families and communities. I'm not here tonight to challenge tra traditional values. I'm here to reclaim them. I'm here to tell you that you don't have to choose between same-sex marriage and traditional values because they aren't really in conflict. They are in harmony. Now, if you came here tonight looking for an argument that will justify the exclusion of gay people from marriage, Sharif will give you that. He'll present a case that is principled and eloquent. And there's nothing that I can say that will force you to change your mind. But if you're open to the possibility that nobody has to lose tonight, that marriage can be extended to gay couples without losing its essential character, then I want to show you how that can be done. The path I'm going to offer you, the path to reconciliation, starts with three ideas. The first idea is that we have misunderstood what homosexuality is. We have been treating it as a sin. Now, sexual sins are real. Infidelity is a sin. Toying with the affections of another person is a sin. Abusing your body or the bodies of others is a sin. But homosexuality never really belonged in this category. So let me ask for a show of hands. Everyone here who's straight, raise your hand. Okay, now, 
Keep your hand up if you spent a lot of time struggling against your deep desire to be intimate with a person of the same sex. Okay? There are not a lot of hands up. What does that tell us? The reason that most of us have never struggled with our sexual orientation is that it's not a virtue. It's not something we cultivated. It's just the way we were made. And we know it's not going to change. Homosexuality is the same. It isn't a choice or a threat or a temptation. It's not like promiscuity or premarital sex or cheating on your spouse. Homosexuality is an orientation. It's what happens when a perfectly natural condition, the disposition to love a woman or the disposition to love a man, is born into a person of the same sex. Now, we don't know yet exactly how or why this happens, but we do know that it's rare and that very few people who discover that they're gay are able to do anything about it. They just are that way the same way that most of us just are straight. In fact, although we're going to talk tonight about homosexuality and heterosexuality, we really ought to think about this in a different way. The two fundamental sexual orientations in this world are not gay and straight. They are an orientation toward women and an orientation toward men. When straight people talk about homosexuality, we're not really talking about an orientation different from ours. We're talking about those rare cases in which our own orientation, in my case, an orientation toward women, occurs in a person of the other sex. In other words, we're not talking about a kink. We're talking about the same thing that occurs in us. Love, real love. What this means for our discussion tonight is that there's no reason why gay couples can't share the same marital values as straight couples. Love, mutual support, commitment, monogamy. And in fact, they do. Gay people are just like straight people. Many of them don't want to get married, but many of them do. The question we face tonight is this. What are we going to do with these people? What will we do when they show up, as they do in every generation, in our own communities, in our own congregations, in our own families? Will we welcome them to the moral institutions that structure our lives, or will we banish them? Will we tell them that marriage and its values don't apply to them? Now, Sharif will tell you that none of this talk about values really matters. The definition of marriage that he and his colleagues present in their book is fundamentally biological. A same-sex couple cannot bear children together. From the standpoint of reproduction, they don't have compatible equipment. By Sharif's definition, this means they can't have a marriage. With respect, I disagree. All of us know opposite-sex couples who are unable to have children together. For many of them, this is a source of tremendous anguish. None of us would wish that fate on our friends or our loved ones. But if it were to happen to them, who among us would deny them the right to marry? That's exactly how we should think about homosexuality. When somebody says to you that a gay couple can't have a marriage because they can't have children, ask yourself, would I apply that rule to a straight couple. And that's the second idea I want to leave you with tonight. From the standpoint of procreation, homosexuality is a form of infertility. Being born gay means that you will never be able to produce a biological child with the person you love. You can adopt a child. You can have a child using donor eggs or sperm, as many straight couples do. The question tonight is whether the rest of us, those who are lucky enough, as I am, to have biological children, will welcome you, or whether we will declare that your particular form of infertility makes you unfit to marry at all. Sharif writes in his book that the, this kind of infertility is different from other kinds of infertility. He argues that 
even if a heterosexual couple can't make a baby, they can still engage in the sex act that would make a baby if they were fertile. In some cases, that's true. But if we draw the line there, if we say that infertile straight couples can marry, but gay couples can't, then we're no longer saying that the right to marry depends on procreation. We're saying that the right to marry depends on whether you can perform a particular sex act. We're defining marriage in terms of whether you can insert tab A in slot B. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a doctrine of love or morals or family. It is a sexual fetish, and it is unworthy of us. This definition of marriage, a definition based on tab A and slot B, is not just a problem for gay couples. It's a problem for straight couples. By some estimates, 15 million men in this country are physically incapable of performing what Bill Clinton called sexual relations. I'm not just talking about old men. I'm talking about young men, paraplegics. Sharif and his co-authors acknowledge this problem. They admit that under a strict interpretation, these men may be excluded from the traditional definition of marriage. Is that really the world you want to live in? Are you willing to evict paraplegics from the definition of marriage in order to keep out same-sex couples? I think that's wrong. I think it defies any decent understanding of family values. But let's be fair. Let's turn the question around. What happens if we say that marriage depends not on tab A and slot B, but on monogamy and commitment? In his book, Sharif argues that if we make that change, everything will collapse. He argues that without tab A and slot B, there's no reason in principle why any of us could continue to expect monogamy or permanent commitment in marriage. That's a pretty sad view of human nature. It's a sad view of marriage, too. And fortunately, it's wrong. Marriage is stronger than that. It is a powerful moral institution. It draws its power from desires that are deeply embedded in the hearts of people all over the world. The desire to love and to be loved. The desire to form a family. The desire to have a place to call home. The desire to share your life, your whole life, with another person. And that's my third message to you. Marriage has its own logic. It attracts people who want the essential features of marriage. It repels people who don't want those things. Millions of people don't want to settle down. They want to sleep around or have multiple partners or keep their options open. By and large, those people don't get married. They don't want to change the definition of marriage. They just want to stay out of it. It's fine to argue that in theory, gay marriage would destroy the meaning of marriage. For years, pro-family organizations predicted all kinds of chaos if gay people were allowed to marry. But those predictions have not come true. In states where same-sex marriage is legal, the divorce rate has not increased relative to other states, nor has adultery, nor has single motherhood. In the real world, a man doesn't think, the lesbians next door got married, so I'm going to leave my wife. The only direct effect of same-sex marriage on the overall prevalence of marriage is that millions of gay people who previously couldn't embrace and live out the values of this fundamentally stabilizing institution can now do so. In fact, when we legalize same-sex marriage, we actually prevent thousands of divorces because we stop pushing gay people into heterosexual marriages they can't sustain. One of the arguments I've often heard against gay marriage, and you might hear it tonight, is that it deprives children of a mom and a dad, or that it sends a message that moms or dads aren't important. Let me tell you, my kids went to, to a preschool with a boy who had two mommies. Nobody in that community thought any less of me or any of the other dads. Girls don't look at a boy with two mommies and think, I'll grow up and raise a child by myself. 
They can see the difference between one parent and two. Kids do sense a difference between mom and dad. I don't want to be naive about that. Although in my house, mom grills the burgers and dad reads the bedtime stories. But what kids really notice, what they really care about, and what really makes a difference when you look at research on child development is having two parents in a stable and loving home. If we want children to be raised in that kind of household, we should support marriage for everyone, straight or gay. Before I turn the microphone over to Sharif, Two minutes. I want to say a few words uh, in his defense. Some people who share my views about same-sex marriage think that Sharif and people like him are bigots. I do not agree. Sharif is playing a vital role in our democracy. He's articulating principles that many people fear will be lost if we accept gay marriage. What I hope to persuade you of tonight is not that he's wrong about these principles, but that same-sex marriage is not a threat to them. It is an affirmation of them. It is a vindication and a fulfillment of our values. Thank you. Um, I will now turn it to um, Sharif uh, Girgis, who will argue for traditional uh, marriage on the question, is gay marriage good or bad for society? You have 15 minutes. You may begin. Well, thank you uh, so much for having me, and thank you, Will, for agreeing to do this. Will is my favorite Slate writer, and if any of you know Slate, you might think that's a backhanded compliment. Uh, but it's true. He's, he's well, I think, one of the fairest... And, uh, and sharpest commentators on the scene today. He's one of the least predictable in his opinions, and I think you've already seen and you'll continue to see why he makes an excellent uh, interlocutor for this kind of discussion. Um, like Will, I should start out by laying my cards out on the table. I am a Christian. I believe the whole shebang. Okay, I, I think the God who spun the galaxies into being became a carpenter in first century Palestine, and died, and then a couple days later was walking around eating fish sandwiches by the Sea of Galilee. Okay, the whole thing is true, but I'm not going to be arguing from Christian principles today. And it's not because I'm ashamed of them, and it's not because I don't think they have a place in our discussions. I think it's because there is a rational kind of philosophical or reason and policy-based argument to make on the issue. I think there are deep problems and tensions in the case that you just heard from Will. I think we can make them and that we should make them. If you're an unbeliever, this matters to you because you won't accept uh, citations of authority or the scriptures. But even if you're a believer, even if you would accept those, even if you already agree with me on those things, I think there's great value in understanding the rationale behind the conclusions of faith. And the reason is that even according to the Christian faith in particular, that law, the moral law, is not arbitrary. It's not a set of rules that God picked out of a hat and that he could have just picked any others. It is a law of love, of justice and of love. And I'm going to try to convince you today that this very difficult issue, where, as you heard from Will, it sounds like exactly the opposite is true, where the law... The Christian moral principles, worldview on this issue is against love. I'm going to try to show you that it actually serves love and that the choice that it poses to people with same-sex attractions, to people who understand themselves as gay or lesbian, who are gay or lesbian, is not the choice that Will articulates, which is between love and loneliness. In fact, the debate today is not about what love is. It's about what's distinctive of marital love. And the view of marriage, the view of marital love that's behind Will's argument, which he didn't quite make explicit, but which we can and we can scrutinize, collapses any difference between marital love and other forms of companionship. And that's the sense in which it actually ends up, not by intention and not by design and not obviously, 
but in fact, it ends up undermining itself. It undermines the very cause it means to serve. So what is that vision of marriage? Well, you can think about cases that it would include or exclude. So you think of two men who live together and are committed to living together for the long haul. They share all the burdens and benefits of common life. But what brought them together is that they're brothers who never moved out. So they don't have a sexual relationship, not a marriage on Will's view. Or you can imagine the same case where they do have a sexual relationship, but there's a third person in the relationship. And this isn't just a kind of sci-fi scenario. This is, this is something that's increasingly happening. People are coming out of the closet as poly-oriented. There's a very sympathetic profile in New York Magazine of three men in just such a relationship. Not a marriage on Will's view. But what makes marriage different, if the difference, if you take the first distinction between the people who really care about each other, committed to each other, going to be there for the long haul, they're the person you call when you, when you want to find out if the other guy's doing well and so on, but they're brothers, not in, but if they're in a romantic relationship, in. So the distinction is really a a kind of emotional companionship. That's what makes, a sort of deep form of emotional companionship is what makes marriage different on Will's view. And that, before you get to the Bible, before you get to what Jesus said or what Paul wrote to the Romans, even before you get to the moral question of whether same-sex sexual relationships are upright or not, that view gets marriage wrong. And it gets marriage wrong by the very principles that Will thinks it actually supports. Why do I say that? Well, one thing that I think Will and I would agree on, but certainly many people on both sides of the debate agree on, is that marriage, to get off the ground at all, requires a permanent commitment. But if what makes the thing a marriage in the first place is that form of the special emotional connection, that special emotional companionship that two men have when they're in love but not when they're brothers, then that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any more sense than, say, pledging to be together for as long as love lasts, where love is understood as that special romantic connection. That goes, comes and goes, and so if it goes, the marriage has ended. It has collapsed into something else. So permanent commitment starts to look itself pretty arbitrary. The commitment to exclusivity starts to look arbitrary. It's true that for most people, by temperament and taste, sexual exclusivity serves their romantic bond, their emotional connection. But many people identify in a different way and say that actually having a sexually open relationship serves the stability and closeness of their own bond. On this view of marriage, you can't say what's wrong with that. You can't explain as a matter of principle. In fact, your rule that sexual exclusivity is the norm starts to look like an imposition, an arbitrary hang-up, just an attachment to tradition. The idea that marriage involves two people, as I said at the beginning, starts to look arbitrary on this view too. There's no reason of principle that three people can't form that deep emotional bond. You, they're going to make exactly the same arguments, that they are committed to each other for the long haul, they love each other. Many of them who identify as poly-oriented say they can't just settle for one person because there are qualitative differences in the emotional landscape of the relationship when there's three together as a unit. They want to face the world together. They don't want to be stigmatized. If they're raising kids, they don't want those kids stigmatized. They want to file their taxes jointly. They want to be on each other's deeds, on each other's, in each other's inheritance. Every argument that could be made that was implicit in Will's case for same-sex relationships being a marriage could be made by these guys. Yet most of us understand that marriage somehow involves just two. I think even the idea that marriage is inherently a sexual relationship starts to look arbitrary on this view. Obviously, sex fosters and expresses affection, and that's one of the things that makes it distinctively valuable. But if that were all we could say about the connection between sex and marriage, which is all that Will's view allows, there's no reason of principle for marriage to be even presumptively sexual. No reason that a platonic bond, if it's mainly a matter of degree, couldn't have that maximum degree of closeness as well. So permanence, exclusivity, monogamy, 
even sexual union, certainly any inherent connection to family life or through that to the common good. I think every single thing that you walked into those doors thinking makes marriage different, no matter what side you were inclined to to begin with, becomes impossible to explain on this view. Not just that, it starts to look just as arbitrary, radically unjust to support those constraints as to support the constraint that it's a man and a woman. And this isn't just something that some crazy conservative says. It's not just something you have to look up on the Drudge Report. This is something that increasingly many allies of Will's view would say. In, I think, 2006, over 300 LGBT and allied scholars and activists, including professors of mine, not sort of fringe figure, well, maybe fringe figures, but, uh, but, but some very famous figures, Cornell West, Gloria Steinem, said radical justice requires the recognition not just of same sex, but of multiple partner, deliberately temporary, sexually open, even they said multiple household unions, because what makes a family is love and commitment. And who are we to say that it has to be a commitment of this shape and not some other? There are uh, philosophers like Elizabeth Brake who says that the only criterion should be care, that anything else is a kind of arbitrary hangover of Christian or Jewish tradition. I don't think Will's view has any answer to that very deep charge of inconsistency. And you can see from here why this might matter, why it might matter to enshrine in our law and policy this vision of marriage. If we do, if we teach people through our law and through culture and over time in other institutions that what makes a marriage is a certain kind of deep personal fulfillment, the kind of individualist model, that companionship and a certain kind of intensity of emotional connection is what distinguishes it, what keeps it from reverting back to a friendship, that moms and dads are replaceable, and I do think that's part of the case for same-sex marriage. I think it teaches you through the law that it's arbitrary. It would be kind of bigotry to think there's systematic differences between moms and dads. You can imagine that over time, someone who, who learns those lessons from day one will be less likely to value permanence or exclusivity, to think that they have to stay with it for the sake of the kids, especially when the going gets tough. And here, I don't just have to speculate. We have another example, which really pinpoints that this debate didn't start with same-sex relationships. No-fault divorce. When no-fault divorce was beginning to be proposed in California and then in other states in the 70s and 80s, the argument was exactly this. It's not going to hurt you or your marriage. What do you care? If you're in a high-conflict marriage, all this does is it makes it easier to get out. And if you're in a low-conflict marriage, it's not going to affect you. How could what the legislators do in the state house make a man wake up one morning and decide, I'm going to divorce my wife? Well, of course it doesn't work like that. But that's an extremely flat-footed vision of how social institutions work. They don't make someone wake up the next day and do something else. They change our beliefs, our assumptions, our dispositions over time with generations in ways that we don't immediately notice. And those shape our practice. That's the whole reason to have an institution in the first place. And when the data was in on no-fault divorce, now 20, 30 years later, people on the left and the right were beginning to say it made a difference. Three minutes. It made people less likely to stick with permanent commitment to begin with. So now at this point you might ask, well, even if I grant you there's no account of these norms and maybe doubling down on this companionate, pure companionate vision of marriage would undermine those norms in practice or at least make it harder to reverse the trends, what's the alternative? And very briefly, I think the alternative is what the Hebrew scriptures call one flesh union, but you don't just find it there. You find it in Plato, Socrates, Xenophanes, Musonius, Rufus, Plutarch, folks who never touched a Bible, who never met uh, a Hebrew prophet, never got a letter from Paul to their town. And in, in our book, we try to describe it as comprehensive union. In every respect that makes a form of community at all, the community of marriage is comprehensive. What does that mean? It's, well, any kind of community is built by common action, towards common ends. 
in the context of a commitment, committed cooperation. And in those three respects, what makes marriage different is that it's comprehensive. And the first one, common activity. It's a union of heart, mind, and body in the marital act, right? Most people understand that it's a union with the beloved at all levels. And most understand that sex has something to do with that. But it couldn't just be that sex fosters affection. We already saw that. There has to be something more. We say that sex makes people one flesh in the way that I am within myself one flesh. All my parts are working together towards a single end of the whole that they make up. And in the marital act, the man and woman themselves are coordinated together towards a single end of the whole that they make up, towards the reproduction of them as a couple. They have a one flesh union. Whether or not a child comes on that occasion or indeed ever, they extend their union of heart and mind along the other dimension of their beloved, along the body. Because the very act that makes marital love is also the kind of act that makes new life, marriage is oriented to family life and to the wide range sharing that family life calls for, not just because of the couple's decision, not just because of their taste or their choice to do it, but by its very nature. And if it's comprehensive in those senses, in the dimensions of the partners united, and in the range of goods that unite them in family life, it calls for comprehensive commitment. And what does that mean? Well, through time it means permanence, and at each time it means exclusivity. So permanence, exclusivity, monogamy, sexual union, connection to family life, and through that to the common good. Every single one of the features that Will's view cannot explain, this view unites, and therefore it tells you what's distinctive of the marital form of love, and it leaves open every other form of companionship, of deep sharing, which needn't be sexual, and which can be part of the positive vocation of people who aren't in a marriage. Thank you. I should say that lest you think I'm up here, um, you know, checking um, the score of the Broncos and Chargers game, um, the reality is I receive your questions. They may be texted um, to me. Uh, your program tells you how this, you can do that, gives you the address that you can send your questions to. Uh, we're moving to a time of rebuttals um, now, and, uh, and then I will put your questions uh, to the, uh, our, our two debate participants. Um, so you might be thinking about those, you might be sending them because it takes a moment um, for me to, uh, to sift through them. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your opening statements. Um, Will, we go to you first. You have seven minutes, uh, a time of rebuttal of um, Sharif's opening remarks. Uh, thank you. And uh, there's more where that came from. Sharif's got a longer case to make, and maybe he'll have a little chance in, in the rebuttal to expand on his, his, his vision of the alternative to what I presented. Um, the thing that I want you to keep in mind as we're talking about these issues is what I said in the opening about that if you're straight, try to understand that homosexuality is exactly like heterosexuality with a different gender as its object. So, um, so when Sharif makes some of these points, ask yourself whether it makes a difference whether you're straight or gay. For example, the idea that, um, that romantic love goes up and down and that when romantic love was, wanes or when it's at a low ebb, uh, then the marriage might end, the sort of loss of commitment, the ability to sort of push your way through that as a couple, that's the same whether you're straight or gay. Uh, it's not as though allowing gay people to marry will make that more of a problem than it is for straight people. The notion that, um, that um, there's no difference between being, if you can't have children, uh, being together as a couple, as uh, boyfriend and girl, but as boyfriend and boyfriend, as husband and husband, or wife and wife, uh, th uh, that's, uh, I guess I have to invoke the, um, the, the, I think it was uh, Potter Stewart, the former Supreme Court justice, who said, I know it when I see it. I think you know the difference if you're a guy between being with your wife and being with your sister. And I think the same is basically true if you're gay, okay? You know the difference between being with your husband and being with your brother. And remember, gay people are not different. They're not sexualizing everybody. They, are, they understand the difference between these relationships and they feel them the same way that you do if you're straight. Um, the notion that no-fault divorce 
should, as a precedent, should make us wary of embracing same-sex marriage. I have to point out that that was about divorce and that it seems a little strange to me to suggest that because there was a dissolution of the family on that line of analysis based on making divorce easier, we should discourage or legally prevent people from marrying. Uh, it seems to me that what we should be doing is to encourage marrying. Um, and I'll, I'll address some of this about um, the, three, the threesomes and so forth as I go through this. Um, the picture that Sharif paints, the alternative that he got to at the end of a comprehensive union where you become one flesh through the creation of new life, that, that is beautiful. And uh, those of us who have experienced that kind of union in every aspect, including the ability to have biological children together with our spouse, I mean, that's a blessing. But the question tonight is whether we should respond to our good fortune by basically slamming the door on everyone else. And I'm not just talking about slamming the door on gay people. I'm talking about slamming it on everyone who can't meet the biological requirements um, that that definition of marriage would, would impose. Um, uh, and you know, one example I gave before was paraplegics, but what about old people, okay? Old straight people. Um, according to the Census Bureau, 400,000 women aged 45 or older get married in this country in a single year. More than 160,000 of these women are 55 or older, and more than 45,000 are 65 or older. Now, even if you could get pregnant at 45 or by some miracle at 55, you are not getting pregnant at 65. So when you come in and apply for a marriage license and you write down your age, we already know, just as surely as if you were marrying a person of the same sex, that you are not having kids together. But we let you get married anyway. And recently in Virginia, a 96-year-old woman married a 95-year-old man. What are the odds that that couple is having a comprehensive union, becoming one flesh? We let old people marry not because we expect them to put tab A in slot B, but because their marriage, even though they don't do that, affirms the basic values that we expect from all marriages, love and devotion and commitment. There is no biological definition that will cover all the cases where our values tell us that a couple should have the right to marry. There are thousands of women in this country who were born without a womb. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of Americans who don't have XX or XY chromosomes. Some have just an X or an X and two Ys or a Y and two Xs. Some have an X and a Y which makes them genetically male, but they have female sexual anatomy. Are you willing to enforce the biological definition of marriage that Sharif is offering and lock out those people? Or are you willing to make exceptions? And if you're going to make exceptions, why would you make exceptions for every one of those biological abnormalities but not for same-sex couples? Wouldn't it be simpler and fairer and more true to the values of marriage if we applied the same rules to everybody? Two people, an exclusive relationship, devoted love, and lifetime commitment. Now, Sharif says that if we go beyond the tab A and slot B definition, that everything will unravel, that we won't be able to explain why marriage should be permanent or faithful or limited to two people, as he says. But sure we can. Marriage is between two people because the only number of partners you can have that's truly equitable and stable is one. If you try to bring in another husband or another wife, you will ignite fires of jealousy and anxiety that never end. I'm not saying you can't sleep around. It's a free country. But that's not marriage. One minute. Why should marriage be permanent? Because that's what makes it different from dating or living together. It's the ultimate commitment. It's your pledge to give all of yourself to this person and to this person only for the rest of your life. If you're not prepared to make that commitment, you can live together and see how it goes but that's not marriage. Sharif gave the example of a, of a thruple, of a three, these three guys who live together in some kind of sex triangle. I read the same article he did. You know what word never appears in that article? Marriage. And the same thing for the statement that he alluded to about family structures. That's all about, it's called beyond marriage, okay, because 
these people are not trying to redefine marriage. They're trying to construct alternative to mar alternatives to marriage. The examples that Sharif gave you don't show you that the meaning of marriage is unraveling. They show the opposite. Even radicals and libertines know exactly what marriage is. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, uh, Sharif, you have uh, seven minutes uh, to rebut. Great, so the first point that Will makes is, look, everybody has ups and downs in a relationship, gay or straight. Well, that's exactly the point. The point is this. It's not that there's, the straight people don't have ups and downs and uh, gay couples do. It's that if we double down in our law and culture on this idea of marriage, deep emotional connection is what makes it special. Then when the couple has ups and downs, or when they have a down that doesn't go back up, they will think, that's it. The marriage is over. It would be inauthentic to stick with it, because we don't have what makes a marriage. What our law and our culture from day one have been teaching us makes marriage special. That's not just something I think. That liberal individualist idea of marriage as a form of personal fulfillment, where that's basically an emotional thing, is something that Andrew Cherlin, a Johns Hopkins University sociologist and a supporter himself of same-sex marriage, agrees. And he agrees, to get to Will's second point, that that was the vision that we began to enshrine in our law and culture with no-fault divorce. The point of the no-fault divorce example, I mean, it's true, yeah, it makes divorce easier, but that's just something that happens outside the relationship. Why should that change anything more than as the small margin that might be due to conflict, high, high conflict marriages. What Andrew Cherlin himself agrees no fault divorce began to do was enshrine this idea that you don't have to have, listen, it's in the name, you don't have to have a fault to cite to get out of the marriage because if it doesn't have the deep emotional fulfillment, it's not authentically a marriage. The case of infertility, an infertile couple just like a couple who's fertile but it's on their wedding night or a year before their first child comes or after the last one leaves for college or whatever, is capable of comprehensive union. They can unite in heart, mind, and body. Their relationship is oriented to family life, not just by choice, but because the very act that seals their bond is also the kind of act that makes new life. Recognizing them as a, as, uh, a marriage doesn't send a new signal about what makes a marriage. It doesn't say marriage is mainly set apart by emotional union. It says marriage is this whole package together. And recognizing them has the benefit of reinforcing something else that is part of my view of marriage, which is that marriage isn't just instrumental to kids. It's not just a, an instrument for boosting SAT scores. It is valuable in itself. And the more we teach that by recognizing marriages, comprehensive unions, wherever they exist, the better it is for the instrumental benefits of marriage, the more likely people are to have the kind of regard for each other that would last anyway. There are cases where people can't form even that, but they're an opposite sex couple. But on any view of marriage, there are gonna be limits between the fit of the basic view and what we enforce through law because of privacy. Even if you thought that a special emotional connection was what really made a marriage, you wouldn't wanna administer tests to couples to ask them to rate each other separately and then compare the numbers. That's an invasion of privacy. The same thing is true here. You can think that that's, uh, it's still a terrible thing for this view to say that, oh, if you don't have bodily union, you don't have a marriage. But if you did, and this is really inherent in Will's point about slot A and tab B, you'd probably be motivated without even fully articulating it by a view of the body that says it doesn't fundamentally matter. It's mainly a form of, it's an instrument for fostering something else that does matter, which is emotions and feelings of closeness and regard and vulnerability. But there are all kinds of realms where we see that the body really does matter. If you went to a uh, hospital to give birth and then you found out that the hospital had just randomly swapped babies before returning them, you would feel deeply cheated. And not just because of this contingent thing that you had formed a special connection with it for nine months, but because it makes a difference. It's part of the tragedy of infertility that Will was talking about. 
that this is flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. The idea that the a damage to my body is violation, whereas damage to my property is just vandalism, that there's a deep difference in kind. All of these different ways we have of understanding that the body is really a part of you. And so it's not just that marriage is just biology, as he continues to say. It's really that biology is crucial to what one of the things that makes marriage different. And Two that minutes. matters because the body is really a part of us. I can describe his view, he says slot A, tab B. Well, I could say the same thing, saying he just has a view that values orgasm. But that would be a kind of denigration of the view that he's really motivated by. And it just shows that you can give labels that undermine any view. The question is, is there a true label of the view that highlights its distinctive value? Everything he said at the end in attempting to answer my challenges was purely parasitic on my view. Imagine if I got up here and I said to you, oh, here's the case against same-sex marriage. Everybody knows that's just not a marriage. That argument would have worked five years ago, but I doubt that five years ago he would have agreed with it. That's question begging. If I had said, no, you know what the problem is? The problem is these gay couples, they just don't have any stability. I mean, I just know it. And if you, if you press me for a study, well, I just said, no, I mean, think about it. I mean, you can just tell. That's basically what he said about the throuple. That's not an One argument. Minute. It assumes that you already agree with him on those points, so he doesn't really have to defend them from within his view. That's not an argument. It's purely parasitic on the comprehensive view of marriage that I articulated at the beginning that explains why all these things go together. And he has tried to take one element out and keep all the rest together. And since you all agree with all of the rest, he can afford to do that rhetorically. But it doesn't work rationally. Very good, thank you. Okay, now, uh, gentlemen, we move to a, uh, to a time of Q&A. Um, we're going to give you the opportunity to ask each other um, a, uh, a question. And um, why don't we begin? Uh, Will, why don't you ask uh, a Sh uh, Sharif a question? Okay, uh, this is a short one. Uh, Sharif, do you believe that it's wrong to engage in homosexual activity? In same-sex sexual activity, yes. I agree. I think that it's wrong to engage in any non-marital sexual activity. I think it's, there's, it's not especially wrong to engage in the same-sex kind. But here's the reason I didn't cite that as a premise of my argument. I think it's something that you come to after understanding the conjugal view of marriage. There's first the question of what makes a marriage. And then you have to build a separate argument for why you do or don't think that non-marital sexual activity is immoral. And that's going to be something that you could go either way on, but you first would have to answer the question of what makes marriage different. Very good. Um, Sharif, perhaps you'd like to pose a question to Will. Yeah, well, I guess since I've sort of boldly said at the end that you really didn't have any answer to the challenges that I posed, I would repose them and maybe just take a specific example. Um, is it really enough to say against the poly -orient, people who identify as poly-oriented and who do ask for marriage recognition to say, possibly without evidence, maybe even with evidence, you guys are just too unstable. I know it because you know, I hear about stories of jealousy all the time. Well, I'd say a few things about, about the polys. Um, the, and I, I know people who are in this kind of a situation. Um, it is, and it's not a marital situation, and that's part of, I, th I think, the point. Um, I don't believe there are that many people who in this country or in the world who actually want to marry as opposed to have sex with more than one person. There's a, there's a big difference between those things. Poly, uh, polygamy and polyamory is much, much more radical than homosexuality. Homosexuality only changes the sex or the gender to which the same rules apply. Uh, you can still have monogamy, you can still have lifetime commitment. You can't have, um, you certainly don't have monogamy with, with poly. And what, what poly does is I do argue that, that uh, polygamy is, is um, inherently unstable. Um, actually, if you look at the Bible, there's lots of evidence of, of jealousy and tension in those relationships. Um, and my, my, my shorthand for this is one is not the number of people that you want to sleep with. One is the number of people you want your partner to sleep with. And that is sort of the, that's the foundation of monogamy. Um, I also think that there's uh, that the social risk 
of legalizing polygamous marriages is higher. So the overwhelming majority of men are heterosexual. So if you legalize gay marriage, we're not gonna, these guys are not going to run out and marry other men. But uh, if you were to legalize polygamous marriage, believe me, there are lots of guys who would love to have an excuse to go out, who would love to have an excuse to go to bed with uh, another woman. Um, and the other thing that I would say about this is that excluding polygamy from the definition of marriage is not nearly as oppressive as um, excluding homosexuality. Uh, if you're gay in Alabama right now, you're, you're not allowed any spouse at all. You're completely shut out. And I think, as Sharif just said, the, I think if this is fair to your view, you can't, you, you can't have sex unless you're married, and you can't be married if you're gay. So if you're gay, you've got to be celibate. I think that pretty much follows. And that's extremely oppressive to declare that to everyone who's gay. Um, but if you're a guy and you want to marry two women, uh, we actually let you marry one of them. We just don't let you officially marry the second, and I just don't think that's nearly as oppressive. Very good. Um, Sharif, a question from the audience. Is it possible for you to teach your children not to discriminate and hate the LGBT community if you are at the same time teaching them that gay marriage is wrong? Absolutely. Um, in fact, historically, the cultures and societies that have had male-female marriage have spanned the spectrum on homosexuality. Some of them didn't even know about sexual orientation in the way that we do today. Some of them were perfectly okay with same-sex sexual relations, for example, between men in ancient Greece. Um, and some of them, like France, like contemporary France, which had a huge, at least which had a huge resistance to the push to recognize same-sex relationships as marriages, had for years um, had a kind of domestic partnership status for them, had very libertine sexual uh, views as, as a matter of public opinion. Um, there's nothing bigoted about saying that male, female, the kinds of union possible between a man and a woman is part of what makes marriage distinct. And, and you know, you might think it is because of the thing that Will ended with. So let me just say one quick thing about that. You are likely to think that a life, first of all, the, the view of marriage doesn't say anything about morals laws. I don't think we should ban um, private consensual sexual activity uh, that doesn't have third party effects and, and is um, between adults. But even just taking the view of marriage itself and then the view about non-marital sexual activity, you are likely to think that that is a worse result, that some people will in practice not have sex, to the extent that you already have something like the revisionist view. Why? Because that's a view, as I tried to illustrate, on which what makes marriage different is closeness, is intensity, intimacy, vulnerability. There's intimacy and marriage and sex on one side and drinking buddies on the other side. And of course, if that's your vision of marriage, the prospects are extremely bleak. But I think that's actually one of the inhumane aspects of the basic vision of marriage behind Will's argument. I think the conjugal view, by giving marriage a more specific shape, actually opens up the realm for deeper forms of companionship and intimacy. And this is something I think you see in the historical record, where you see letters between men in the Civil War. There are countless examples, David and Jonathan in the Bible, where you see between men, for example, deep forms of affection and intimacy outside a sexual context because they had a very more specific view of what made a marriage. So in some ways, this view, the conjugal view, is really liberating for finding fulfillment outside of sexual union. Very good. Um, uh, for Will. <clears throat> Isn't it self-evident, a question from the audience, isn't it self-evident by simple anatomical examination that same-sex union is unnatural? Well, uh, it, it is certainly true that you can't procreate with your uh, beloved if you are uh, homosexual. You, can, you, you, would, you would have to do what a heterosexual couple would, could, would do if they were um, incapable of, of uh, producing a child together. You would have to adopt, you, you could use um, an assisted reproductive technology. Um, and 
I think that all of us have to ask ourselves, why would we treat those two situations differently? Why wouldn't we say that the couple who cannot procreate together, and remember, infertility is not necessarily that both people can't have kids, that they, together they can't have kids, right? That is, that is true of that straight couple, that is true of that gay couple. Why not say the same thing about the straight couple? Well, God didn't want you to have kids, so you shouldn't be married. It's not natural, you don't fit. What, you know, what do we do? I didn't quote all the numbers, but if you look at medical literature, there are hundreds of thousands of people who do not fit the biological norm, right? They don't, there are women who, who they don't have a uterus. There are women who have what's called an incomplete vagina. There are, there are all sorts of chromosomal things. There are all sorts of reasons why biologically someone would be A, abnormal, and B, unable to have children. And the, what I cannot figure out is how we can rationally defend the idea that all of those people who are sort of by, in biological terms, unnaturally fit for procreation, should be allowed to marry, but only the gay people should be excluded. Okay, very good. Um, Sharif, uh, back to you. Isn't your opposition simply that of uh, uh, born of your religious conviction and therefore really has, uh, has no broader application to society? Well, no. Um, I think it comes from it's just, everything about my life is shaped by faith. There's no question about that. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, I've also spent years studying this stuff. Uh, I've spent years doing the kind of hard work in philosophy that involves going to the very best contrary arguments and seeing if I can answer them. I have never found, not in this debate, not in previous debates, and I've had over 70 or, not, or 80 uh, lectures and discussions and Q&A and so on with with audiences at law schools, philosophy departments, and the rest of it. Never found answers to what I think are some decisive objections to the contrary view. And if you don't believe my autobiographical story about this, you don't have to. As I said at one point, remarkably similar views of sex and marriage were espoused by people who had no connection to Judaism or Christianity. I gave you a long list before, but let me make it just concrete here. Uh, Gregory Flastos, who is, uh, as far as I know, a secular liberal, kind of atheist, and certainly socially liberal, professor of ancient philosophy at Princeton, said that to his chagrin, Pope Paul VI, Catholic pope who had basically the same vision of sex and marriage, um, very conservative vision by today's lights, had basically the same views of sex and marriage as Plato. In other words, Plato, who obviously didn't have a, a catechism sitting on his desk, never met Jesus, never read anything from the Bible, had articulated, not just at a surface level, but with arguments that remarkably track the basic vision that the historic Christian teaching shares. So it's literally historically impossible that this view is just attributable to religion. Uh, thank you. Um, back uh, to Will. A uh, question from the audience, Will. <clears throat> uh, you've kind of touched on this um, just, uh, just a bit in one of your, your previous uh, um, responses, but where do you draw the line on marriage? What if I wanted to marry multiple men or women or a child or my dog? I want to be clear, this isn't my question. Um, <laughs> on, uh, on what basis do you limit it? Okay, wait, let me get that list again. Child, dog, what was before that? <laughs> Multiple men or women or a child or my dog. Right, well, so I agree with uh, Hillary Clinton. The only people who matter in a marriage are the three people who are in it. Um, not really. Uh, she didn't say that. Uh, so I sort of made the case against, against uh, m marrying multiple people. Um, now. Uh, it's true, I, can't, I don't have a scriptural citation for that. I can't give you a foundational principle that is outside humanity, but I think the principle inside humanity is pretty sound. There is a logic to marriage. There is a logic to monogamy. And it is that principle of, frankly, I, I, I wish I could find a, a, a more uplifting term for jealousy, but jealousy is real, folks, and we all know it. And the idea that you do not want your partner to have more partners than you is extremely fundamental, and that, that 
provides for a certain kind of stability that is not possible in, in multiple partner relationships. Again, I'm not saying it's a free country. If you want to go out and sleep with a lot of people, you can do that, but that's not marriage. And I think everyone intuitively understands that that is a different thing. Um, a child, well, that's kind of an easy case because a child can't consent. Um, and so we are talking here about relationships between adults who can consent. Um, there's no issue there for of exploitation. Uh, the, the dog, uh, uh, I think this one comes from Rick Santorum. Uh, w without getting too gross, let's just say that the animal can't consent either. Um, you know, rough does not mean yes. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't really worry about about things going crazy. Again, if it's really hard. One of the things I want to communicate is if you're a straight person, if you've never been gay, you're, not, you know, you're just straight, you don't understand what it's like to be gay. Just think exactly the same as you, except with an orientation to the other sex, to the other gender from the one that you're oriented to. And all of the same feelings, principles apply. So the world is not going to get crazy uh, if we legalize this as we should. That's a very good segue into the, uh, the next question uh, from the audience for you, Sharif. Uh, is sexual orientation a choice? If so, when did you choose to be straight? No, I, I don't think sexual orientation is a choice. I think it's something that people find themselves with, they don't choose to have. But I don't think that proves anything. I think, in fact, I was recently reading that scientists have discovered a genetic basis for the desire for multiple partners. It's the Y chromosome. And it's not, doesn't make an inch of progress against my argument that monogamy is crucial to a comprehensive commitment. So I don't think it's, it's relevant here or there. It's, it's just something to leave to the scientists. Very good, back to, uh, back to you, Will. Um, does uh, question from the audience, does society have any interest in promoting procreation? Well, society certainly has an interest in creating stable environments in which to raise children. And I think Sharif would agree, all of the literature on child development says kids do better in a stable household. And they do better in a two-parent household. There was a lot of relativism in the, in the last few decades about single parenthood. And, uh, we, we should all sort of read what, what the evidence says. It says that two parents are important and stability is important. Um, and those are all arguments against uh, any kind of loose polyamorous situation. They're arguments against single parenthood by choice. But they're not arguments against same-sex marriage. There are, to my mind, these are an argument for same-sex marriage. There are lots of kids right now being raised in households that are headed by two men or two women. They, could, they come from a, a prior marriage uh, in many cases. Um, and I think it is strongly in the interest of society that we make sure that those kids have a stable home. We make sure that those spouses can legally marry and can be not under just the rights of marriage, but the obligations of marriage. I think that will provide a better environment for those children. Um, Sharif, uh, on a similar note, um, should the government regulate marriage at all? Well, I think it should. Um, you can think of this in historical terms. It's very hard to find true consistencies across pretty much every time and culture that we have any record of. But one consistency we do have is that every society has socially regulated the sexual relationships of men to women. Why is that? It must be that that regulation answers to a human need that's really universal and that there's no other way of meeting. And it's obviously to create the culture that reinforces the stabilizing norms we were just talking about, without which children don't do well. In fact, I think if you tried to get the state out of the marriage business at the beginning of the process, you just didn't have the state declare anybody married to anyone else, you would actually expand the state tremendously because you would require it to do a lot more at the other end where relationships break up, custody battles ensue, property and other kind of disputes will arise, and where children who haven't had the benefit of the stability of their own mother and father will need a bigger correctional and welfare bureaucracy to meet their needs less efficiently and more intrusively. So I think if you really cared about limited government, which is a pretty frequent uh, concern behind that question, you would actually care about marriage. 
Will, uh, why are civil unions not enough? Um, why the title marriage? I guess I'd turn that question around and ask why draw the distinction. I mean, one question is, first of all, would the civil union have the same legal rights and responsibilities as a marriage, in which case it seems a little bit strange to draw that distinction. I mean, if we were to do that, in a few years we would look back and say, what, you know, what is this? Um, it doesn't really make sense. There's also, of course, a stigma attached to that. I mean, there was a, a time when um, you could go to a water fountain if you were black, just as you could go to a water fountain if you were white, but you had to go to different water fountains. And we decided as a country that separate and, and, and equal was not truly equal. Um, there, uh, I guess to me, I, I would argue that the presumption should be the other way. You should have to make a case why, uh, given that the, first of all, you'd have to make a case why gay people should have fewer rights than straight people in a marriage, right? Or if you believe they should have the same rights, why you should call it by, by another name. It seems to me the only argument you can make for calling it by another name is that somehow, uh, as Sharif suggests, people will get confused then and they will no longer believe that a marriage entails monogamy or commitment. And um, with respect, I believe that there are there are features within marriage, there is an essential dynamic within people and within the logic of society that will support those, those principles, uh, whether or not it is a same-sex couple, sex couple or an opposite-sex couple. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna let you uh, ask Sharif another question, so you might be thinking about that, and uh, Sharif, here, you in a moment as, uh, as you get just a bit of time. Um, to Sharif, uh, how does your view fit within the proud American tradition of non-discrimination? It's not discrimination. Um, let me say more. It's, it's not drawing an arbitrary distinction. It, it fits into that venerable tradition in just the same way that the exclusion of the thruple or the deliberately temporary relationship and so on um, fits into it as well. It doesn't make arbitrary distinction. It's, it tracks a difference that's real and that makes a difference. Um, the, as I said, if you look at his, you can look at history for instruction. Nowhere in history were interracial marriages rejected until colonial America, right? That's the, the tradition people are often thinking of, well, the, inter the overcoming interracial marriage bans. Why was it first arising in colonial America? Because that was the first time that caste, social stratification, matched race. By the, on the contrary, so it was clearly motivated um, as a form of white supremacy, as the Supreme Court later said. By contrast, this vision of marriage as male-female arose, as I said before, in every imaginable context with regard to homosexuality, ignorance of it, favoring sexual relationships between men or between women, and so on. So it's historically impossible to attribute this to the same discriminatory motive. Um, I, again, you'll ask uh, Will a question here in a moment, so you might be thinking about that, and uh, to you, uh, Will, question from the audience. Are there no other differences between men and women than gen genitals? Um, does your ta doesn't your tab A slot B characterization assume this? Well, I am not one of these people who believes that there aren't differences on average between men and women. I mean, I, we all know that there are physical differences uh, in, in average strength, for example, which is why I think still no woman has yet passed the Marine Officer Infantry course. Um, but there's a difference between, between having a difference between a group on average and having a categorical difference where everybody in one group is superior to everybody in the other group by whatever measure you're talking about. Um, with men and women, there are differences on average, but there is a lot of overlap. Um, and so I, I, I guess I would want to stay away from, I would acknowledge what the questioner is saying, of course, that there are differences on average between men and women, but nothing so stark that one would draw a categorical legal line between them in terms of women are not allowed to do this or that because they are weaker or men are not allowed to do this or that because they are dumber. Um, so I guess with, we, we should live in a world where we acknowledge gender differences but without drawing legal boundaries that strictly separate the sexes in that way. Okay, um, uh, Will, a question for Sharif. Okay, so Sharif, I believe you said earlier, you do not believe that homosexuality is a choice. Right. 
Right. So should we then treat it like other things that are not a choice, like race or sex? Should it be illegal to discriminate on the basis of homosexuality in all the same respects that it is illegal to discriminate on the basis of race or sex? Well, I do think that any kind of arbitrary distinction based on sexual orientation is unjust and should be excluded. Now, that just leaves the open, the question, of whether it's arbitrary to restrict marriage to male-female relationships. It just assumes. I mean, if, if the idea was, well, because we allow interracial marriage, we have to allow same-sex marriage if you think race and orientation should be treated the same. Well, that just assumes that marriage is inherently just a deep emotional bond and not the kind of comprehensive union that only man and woman can form. I can turn it around. I could ask you, you know, if it turned out that um, there is such a thing as a poly orientation, which is something that I don't think has been seriously studied. Some people claim it. it it's scoffed at by most people today, but the same claim would have been scoffed at you know, 100 years ago about homosexuality. If it turned out that that was true, since you're committed to non-discrimination on the basis of orientation, do you think we would have to recognize three-person relationships? And I suspect, based on your answers so far, you would say no, because that's not a marriage. It's different. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, Sharif, a question for Will. Uh, Will, do you think it's unjust for the state to teach or to have as a purpose promoting male-female parenting as an ideal? Well, I think, I think for any group of people in society who do an important social function, as parents do, the state ha definitely has an interest in promoting an ideal, um, in promoting, for example, the idea that you stay with your partner. You're going to have children together. You, we, they need a stable home. You should stick it out. Um, that's certainly relevant to that set of people. What would be strange to me would be to promote that ideal to gay people, because for them, the natural thing to do is pair them up in the same way that we, would, that we pair up straight people, except they'd be paired up with the same sex. And for them, they should have a similar model. There should be a model, and, and increasingly there is. And I think thanks to gay marriage, um, if you're a gay person today, you can see, I mean, you couldn't see this 20 or 30 years ago. You know, you could go to a bar, but you could go to a bathhouse, but you couldn't get legally married. And now you can. You can see these models. I think it's wonderful that the state is actually promoting not just the ideal of heterosexual marriage, but it is creating a models of, of homosexual marriage. And I think that's just great for society all around. Okay. Um... <laughs> Uh, very good. Uh, a question for both of you. What would you say to those who oppose the institution of marriage altogether on the grounds that it is an oppressive institution? Let's start with you, Will. Uh, <laughs> I feel like making the liberal rejoinder, if you don't like marriage, don't have one. Uh, it's not complicated. Um, no one forces you to get married. Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with having an institution that people can... Nobody forces you to go to church. You can tell you a church is oppressive. You, you know, you, the, you may not like the church. Don't go to that church. Go to a different church or don't go to church. So um, I guess I, I don't think that... I certainly don't think marriage is oppressive. And in fact, the whole history of marriage has been an evolution toward uh, many of the value, many of our modern values. It's much more egalitarian than it was before. Um, and there, are, there will certainly be turns, as Sharif talked about, with no-fault divorce, where we can have a debate about whether something was forward or sideways or backward, and, and we can adapt. And that's one of the great things about marriage, is that it's a social institution and it's susceptible to reform. You know, I was looking forward to just being able to say I agree on one question with Will, but I actually there's part of his answer that I disagree with, and that's the part that he started with. He said, if you don't like marriage, just don't get married. That lays bare an assumption that's been at work in all of his answers, I think, which is that institutions only have immediate effects. If tomorrow we opened up marriage to all same-sex relationships, it would just have that effect, nothing down the road. And similarly, the, the, the li certain kind of liberal who's really worried about the oppressive effects of marriage is worried that a culture in which marriage is a norm is one in which women are going to be oppressed in ways that you can't simply isolate by deciding as an immediate matter, I'm not going to get married. 
So I do think it shapes culture, and that's the assumption behind the question. I just think it shapes culture in healthy ways. I think there are extremes. You can imagine, and we certainly can read about cultures, where women were oppressed relative to men. But I think that was an aberration of the ideal of marriage, which as a relationship requires a kind of mutuality, complementarity, but equality. Um, in, it was just as much an aberration from marriage as other forms of deviations. Very good. We will uh, move to closing statements in just a moment. A, uh, a couple of more questions, and I must say they are, they are tough ones um, to you, Will. Were it ever proved that sexual attraction to children, a la Jerry Sandusky, was uh, demonstrated to be natural, should that also be permitted? Well, good luck to proving that. Uh, the, my, my, I have a very short answer to anything about kids, okay? Kids can't consent. There are principles of consent and harm that everyone, all, all liberal, no matter how liberal you are, you can basically agree on those things. Um, and it's very important when we hear casual litanies, um, as we've heard from some politicians, from homosexuality, to polygamy, to incest, to uh, uh, exploitation of children, to pedophilia. Um, that it's, it, we hear that, and it's very important to distinguish these things. Homosexuality is exactly the same as heterosexuality in all relevant respects other than sex. And that is not, as, I, as I've argued, that is not a moral difference. When you start messing with kids, that is a moral difference. Yes, you can have, uh, and I believe there is evidence that people who have an attraction to children, it's, it's, very, it, it's, it's very difficult to get rid of. Those people, what, that is a harmful thing. Homosexuality is not a harmful thing. So I don't think, A, that we need to treat homosexuals the way we treat pedophiles, and I certainly don't think we should give pedophiles the same rights that we give to gay people as we do to straight people. Very good. Uh, final question um, for our, uh, our Q&A and this uh, for you. Sharif, uh, in what way are you not promoting bigotry as a white supremacist might have done in this city 50 years ago? Sure. Well, you think about the reason to keep, uh, to ban interracial marriage. The reason on its face is to keep black and white people from mixing in order to keep the purity and supremacy of the whites. It's as simple as that. Like I said, you look at the history, it never showed up anywhere. It wasn't answering to some general human need until a context where race was the basis of class in society. And then it showed up, obviously answering to a specific so-called need of white supremacy. This is completely different. This isn't about keeping anyone apart. No one thinks that the original people who formed society got together long ago and decided, how can we oppress gay people? I know we'll invent marriage, right? That's a completely absurd account. And I don't think there's that much more to the objection that says that excluding same-sex relationships from marriage is a form of oppression against gay people. Very good. Um, gentlemen, we, uh, we now move to closing statements. And you'll recall what I said at, uh, at the beginning, that uh, because Will went first, which is deemed to be in a, a debate something of a, uh, a disadvantage. Um, Sharif uh, then has the disadvantage of going first with clothing, closing statements, which then allows um, Will to have the final word. So Sharif, you have um, five minutes. Uh, you may begin. Sure. Well, um, again, I want to begin by thanking both Larry and Will and all of you. I think this has been a great uh, discussion. I basically think, at the end of the day, that Will's positive arguments and his answers to my objections were both empty at the core. Why is that? It's a strong claim. Well, the positive argument was empty at the core because it hid the ball. It took for granted. It never laid bare the answer to the central question for figuring out whether this is arbitrary or not, which is, what is marriage? At every turn where he could have answered that question, he just said, uh, just, just understand this is exactly the same thing in your case as it is in their case, only different. But the whole question in this debate is whether it really is different. Not different in the sense of being lesser. Nobody thinks that just because a relationship isn't a marriage or just because two people can't have a marriage, they can't have something of deep value, in fact, of life-changing significance. 
And that's part of the picture of the positive vocation that people can have with, even if they're not married. But what makes marriage, what makes that specific good relationship different? He never gave you an answer. And then on the answers to my objections, he only said things which if I had said on this stage, I would have been laughed off the stage because there isn't a divided, quest, a divided audience on the things I was raising for him as challenges on permanence and exclusivity and monogamy, but there is a divided audience on this one. So he was able to get away with things. So he says, for example, oh, look, why does permanence, exclusivity, and monogamy matter? It's all part of the inner logic of marriage. It's just part of the inner logic. That's parasitic on the view of marriage I was defending, which can explain why they do go together. But not just that, it's also parasitic on our being in a culture that for, that's part of a broader civilization which for centuries, and in fact millennia, was shaped by that vision of marriage. This stuff doesn't come for free. It doesn't come naturally, permanence and exclusivity and monogamy, or else there would have never been an institution of marriage in the first place. If it really comes naturally, you don't have to socially regulate it in every time and culture. That's a remarkable fact that calls out for explanation. The only way of explaining it is that it doesn't come naturally without a vision of marriage that society promotes and enforces. And if that vision can't make sense of these norms, then over time you can expect them to erode in practice and we can look at cultures and times where they have eroded because it's not natural in the sense of just spontaneously occurring. There isn't an inner logic in that sense. It takes a vision and a vision that's upheld by society. And changing that vision, while it just ha has more than its immediate effects, which are the only ones that Will was focusing on. So he was taking all of that Two for minutes. granted. He would also say things like, well, that's, I mean, Look, the reason those relationships don't count is just because they're unstable. Again, a kind of empirical claim without empirical evidence. But even if there was systematic evidence, so first of all, if I had said something like that, you'd want studies, rightly so. But second of all, even if I produced the studies, you might just come back and say, well, why is that a basis for denying a basic right? After all, there are plenty of heterosexual relationships, two-person heterosexual relationships that are unstable. That doesn't mean we deny them marriage. We try to encourage things. He's given you answers that in my mouth in, on this analogous issue would have never worked, and rightly so. Why? Because he could afford to take for granted that you already accepted them. And then at the beginning, when he was trying to give the positive account, every time again that the question could have come up, well, what vis vision of marriage is behind these arguments, he would shift attention and just say, it's just, just fill in here whatever would be true of the kind of relationship that we've long recognized as a marriage. These are, he's, this is a vision that's very well motivated. It's motivated by a fear of loneliness. Nobody wants to consign themselves or their loved ones to loneliness. And on that, Will and I agree. I think this vision of marriage that says what makes it different is intimacy actually makes the world a little bit more atomistic, a little bit more lonely in the long run because it says to anyone who isn't married for whatever reason, whether because they're gay or lesbian or because they have other responsibilities that prevent it, it says to them, you have to settle for less. That reinforces the stigma. It reinforces the difficulty of making it through this world without a partner. Whereas my view of marriage, by making Time. marriage more specific, opens up the, comp the landscape for companionship. Thank you. Will, you may begin. Um, thank you, Larry. Thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you, Sharif. Um, and I want to steal your joke about the Y chromosome. Okay. Uh, I, I do think, I, I do hope that you all remember what Sharif said about intimacy and loneliness, because every straight person here knows that there is a special kind of intimacy you have with the person that whom you love, the person you choose to marry, and I hope we will extend that to everyone in this, in this country and in this world. Um, how many of you know the serenity prayer? For those of you who don't, these are the words. God, grant me serenity to accept the things I cannot change. 
Grant me courage to change the things I can, and grant me wisdom to know the difference. That's really what we've been talking about tonight. That's the core of this whole conversation. For millennia, we have made a terrible mistake in how we have understood homosexuality and treated gay people. That mistake includes how we have interpreted and applied scripture. We thought homosexuality was a choice and a sin. We confused it with lust and license and promiscuity, and in some cases, even with rape. We thought we could get rid of it with burnings and beatings and electric shocks and therapy. We thought we could make gay people straight. We were wrong. Yes, there are some people who can go from loving a woman to loving a man, but millions of people in this country, thousands in this state and in this city, are simply gay. They are gay just as surely as most of you in this room are straight. And they are no more capable of becoming straight than you are of becoming gay. Oh, they tried. They tried to live the lives of straight people. We told them they had to marry people of the opposite sex. And many of them did. But that didn't make them straight. All it did was put millions of straight people into marriages with gay people who tried and tried but could not love their spouse the way a husband or a wife should. The landscape of our society is littered with the wreckage of families that broke apart because a gay spouse could no longer fake it. We did not serve anyone in these households, not the husband, not the wife, certainly not the children. We have a lot of repenting to do. But the truest repentance is to go back and get it right. Two minutes. We were not wrong to promote marriage. Marriage is healthy. Marriage is good. Marriage is exactly what Sharif says it is. It is a stabilizing norm. Marriage will do for gays the same thing it has done for straights. It will domesticate sexuality. It will organize people's lives. It will strengthen communities. It will create a stable environment for raising children. We weren't wrong about any of those things. We were only wrong about one thing, and that's the thing we're talking about tonight. That's the thing we can change. That's the thing we must change. Yes, same-sex marriage should be legal. Not just legal, but encouraged. One minute. Churches should promote it. Ministers should consecrate it. The gay couples in a congregation should be held accountable just like the straight couples. Admitting our mistake and correcting it will be hard. As the prayer says, 30 seconds. It takes wisdom and courage. You have the wisdom now. The rest is up to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, just a, uh, a couple of, uh, of words as we uh, conclude um, this evening. I, I don't think you can fully realize how difficult um, doing events of this type are until you're on this side of it. Um, uh, we've discovered uh, over the years and engaging on, uh, on topics that are highly controversial, which tend to be the more interesting um, topics that there's an awful lot of uh, insecurity and fear, and on none of them has that been more true than on the topic of gay marriage. Um, 
Uh, there's been much interest expressed in this debate and in these two, uh, two men, but much fear also um, in uh, even attendance at an uh, event of this kind. And so I want to begin first by commending you for your courage, for your willingness uh, to come and to hear another perspective, to hear someone who, with whom you might disagree sharply, these two men who are here on this stage. But I also want to say to you um, that I, I hope you can appreciate um, the courage of these two men um, and uh, their willingness um, to come here tonight and to take a, uh, a position, um, a, a highly controversial um, position on an issue um, like this. Um, they're under an awful lot of pressure. Um, they spend um, weeks, perhaps months, um, years in uh, some sense in preparation um, for this, and it's, uh, it's really kind of nerve-wracking business. And so, um, so, gentlemen, I just want to say to you that I, as somebody, I'll never forget when I stepped on stage to debate Christopher Hitchens, um, just exactly how nerve-wracking something like this can be. So I want to commend both of you for your courage, for your willingness to come here to Birmingham, Alabama, and share your views with us this evening. Thank you. Uh, I think you've both given us a great deal to, um, uh, to think about, and no doubt that when people leave here, um, coffee shops and restaurants will be uh, abuzz with conversation about some of the things that you have said this evening. I want to point out to you that uh, a DVD of this debate will be available soon on the Fixed Point Foundation website. You can pre-order it uh, along with many other um, of our debate DVDs. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you again, gentlemen. Excellent. Good evening.